Hi, this is Andrew, and this is Keynote, the daily now.tv chat show with some of the world's leading thinkers and writers. Hello, everybody. It is September the 1st, 2022, the end of summer. Mm -hmm. Appropriately enough, if we're speaking of the end of, it's also the day that Gorbachev died. Uh, The man who in many ways personifies perhaps the 20th century. He was born um, in 1931, a few years after the First World War, died yesterday, but above all else captured the collapse of the Soviet Union. And perhaps in terms of what uh, Eric Hobsbawm defined as the short 20th century. Uh, Gorbachev, um, Gorbachev epitomizes that century more than anyone. Hobsbawm, of course, was Britain's greatest historian, certainly 20th century historian. His daughter is a dear friend of mine. Um, he believes uh, that the, uh, the short 20th century began with World War I and ended with the collapse of communism, which... Gorbachev um, willingly or otherwise presided over. Uh, Hobsbawm also invented the notion of the long 19th century and indeed the long 18th century. As a Marxist, he saw centuries in grand Hegelian terms. Uh, My guest today challenges Hobsbawm's notion of the short 20th century He's one of America's leading economists. Uh, He teaches at UC Berkeley, speaking to us from Berkeley, where I used to live. Uh, Jay Bradford DeLong, he has a new book out, Slouching Towards Utopia, an an economic history of the 20th century. And it begins, of all places, in 1870. Brad, welcome. Thank you. you How to begin the 20th century with 1870, of all times, you know, when... uh, Bismarck was changing the world. What happened in 1870? Because in 1870, technological progress takes off like a rocket. Um, Up until 1870, even during the Industrial Revolution century, um, human fertility, expanding human numbers, were such as to keep improving technology from doing much, or most times anything, um, from improving human standards of living. You know, your farming techniques get better, but your farm size gets smaller because there are more people crowded onto the land. In 1870, all that changes and things take off like a rocket. You know, human fertility can no longer keep pace with technology, and that means a huge amount. Just as we talk today, Brad, about uh, Gorbachev being yesterday's man, in 1870, you suggested at the beginning of your book that Thomas Malthus was yesterday's man. What is it about Malthusian economics that 1870 buried once and for all? Um, Think of it this way, right? Um, Suppose you're a woman, suppose it's before 1900. You know, if you want to have a comfortable or a happy old age, odds are likely you're going to need surviving sons. Um, to speak for you and to care for you. you know, um, and yet, one third of women will not have you know, surviving sons, you know, outlive them. Um, given how poor humanity was and how high infant and childhood mortality was. Um, thus, before 1870, if you kind of get any additional resources together, you're likely to say we should use them to try to have and raise another kid because God knows we need insurance. Um, Either we have no sons alive at all or we need insurance in case the ones we have die. After 1870, after 1870, technological progress is taking on, starts raising income very fast and people become rich enough that children are well nourished enough that infant mortality begins dropping like a rocket Um, And so you no longer have this Malthusian, we need to have more kids in the hopes that one of them will live imperative. And, you know, as I said, that kind of does more to change how human life is lived for the typical person than 
anything that, that anything that had happened before since the discovery of agriculture. Brad, um, Mark, who of course perhaps is, I'm curious to your take on this, the philosopher of your, or the economic mm -hmm. philosopher of your long century, famously said that we make our own history, but not quite in the way we expect. Uh, one of the things I like about the book is the way mm -hmm. you show that politicians don't always understand progress, economics, technology. Thinking of somebody like Bismarck, who, of course, was the most influential and consequential polit politician mm -hmm. of 1870, the man who quite literally reshaped the world through his unification of Germany. Yes. Did Bismarck, do you think, have any understanding of this new technological world that you're describing? <laughs> He was, by and large, I think a little too early to really understand how big a deal um, technological change was going to be. I mean, he knew a bunch of things. You know, he knew that Prince Metternich's plan back at the end of the Napoleonic Wars to have Prussia stand between France and Austria by giving Prussia the Rhineland so that any French offensive moves would hit Prussia first before Austria, thus Austria would always have an ally that that had given Prussia an amazingly rich and amazingly large industrial province that allowed Prussia to become the leader of Germany and the founder of the German Empire rather than Austria. But I don't think he imagined that he was at the start of an age in which human technology improves so rapidly that you know, the whole economy is overturned and transformed in every generation after 1870 and then is overturned and transformed again in the next one. I mentioned Hobsbawm earlier. Um, what do you make of most grand historians take on the 20th century, not just Hobsbawm, but with their focus on politics and ideology? You're presenting 20th century history, this long 20th century from 1870 to 2010, from the perspective of the economist, you're unambiguously an economist. You yeah. teach economics, you're, you, you're, you're in the um, tradition of Keynes and Hayek and Pagliani and so on and so forth. We'll right. talk about that. Of, of political historians, who do you most respect who wrote these global histories? What about uh, Hobsbawm? What do you think of his work? Well, you have to, I think, most respect you know, Eric Hobsbawm for daring to take on the task. Um, and for doing so intelligently and also amazingly readably, right? That Hobsbawm's books, because they are readable, are massively important and massively influential. Um, you know, so, and because they matter, because what matters is you write something that then sparks you know, ideas and understanding in somebody else. Um, generally, I'd say most historians turn to the politics and sometimes to the military affairs, that the 20th century was all about, are we going to be monarchists or really existing socialists or fascists or neoliberals or social democrats? And that those you know, fights are, are played out um, in politics and in war you know, from 1914 to 1989. Um, Hobsbawm's short 20th century. And, you know, that's a story, that's an important story, but my view is that that is a subpart of a bigger and more important story, which is that after 1870, you know, for the first time in history, technology is advancing fast enough and its effects on reducing human fertility through the demographic transition are big enough that after 1870, for the first time in human history, it becomes possible for humanity to see how it might bake a sufficiently large economic pie that there would potentially be the possibility for everyone having enough. And the possibility of a rich world you know, changes politics and changes everything else in such a way to say, well, no, here we have another struggle, but we just have another century in which there are struggles between regimes and ideologies really does not cut it for understanding what is really going on. You mentioned um, 
that you like Hobsbawm because he made history readable. You've done the same with this book, Brad. Your publisher's weekly, the book is just out. You've got a yeah. starred review. I think it's going to be one of these books that's extremely successful. Mm -hmm. According to Publishers Weekly, you convey a wealth of information in elegant, accessible prose, combining grand epochal perspectives with fascinating discursions. Is that, I mean, it's a nice review, so you're not going to argue Very with nice. it. Is Very that what nice. you were trying to do, write a, a readable economic history? Because most economics, as you know, is pretty unreadable mm -hmm. to anyone, to, to, to lay people like uh, most of our right. audience. I mean, I seriously was, you know, I mean, I did think that, you know, that the story that really needed to be told, um, both for people who want to understand what actually happened over the past 150 years or so, and for us sitting here now wondering how we got here and what we do next, that the story of an enormous leap forward in the pace of technological advance and revolution that for the first time makes utopia seem not a wild and totally impractical dream, but instead something that we might actually touch if only we could figure out how to do it. Um, that that really is what people need to hear, and I want you know, a lot of people to hear that. Do you see Marx as a, an economist and philosopher of the 19th or 20th century? Is he part of your story or is he really out of sync with the world that you're describing? Well, on the one hand, he definitely is part of the story because, you know, Marx takes a look at the transformation of the underlying forces of production between, say, the year 1000 and 1870, um, between the feudal age and the steam power age. And he says, wow, wait a minute, you know, the forces of production have been totally transformed, that you know, whatever running sociological code for how society works that you have cobbled together on top of those forces of production, you know, it, it ran on the feudal system's hardware, but it doesn't all this kings and emperors and knights and orders stuff, it doesn't run at all off of steam power economy hardware. Um, and so as a result, you know, the business class, the bourgeoisie has taken control. But although the bourgeoisie has taken control um, and certainly can figure out how to produce, it cannot figure out how to distribute, how to make a livable human world. And so all we need is a little one more push and we can get rid of the business class of the bosses. And then we'll be able to build a, you know, a socialist utopia. But what Marx missed was, first of all, that even the world of the steam power age was itself very poor by our standards. And we were about in the 140 years after 1870 to have um, at least three technological revolutions, all of them as big as the 1000 to 1870 move from feudalism to the steam power age. We moved from the steam power age to the second industrial revolution, oil and electricity and chemicals age from 1870 to 1920. We moved from that to the mass production age, what the French call the Fordist age from 1920 to 1970. And now we've moved on from the large strong unions, mass production, um, General Motors and Ford age to our current global value chain and information economy age. <clears throat> and all three of those changes are technologically as great in their impact on how people's working and consuming lives are lived, as was the transformation from feudalism to steam power age. And so it wasn't simply easy to get rid of the bosses and have a socialist utopia. Instead, we've had to try on the fly to keep rewriting the sociological code running on top of the forces of production hardware. And we have bollocksed it up. You know, we have been very good at figuring out how to bake a large enough economic pie so that everyone in the world can potentially have enough. We've done a very lousy job at slicing the pie, at figuring out how to equitably distribute it. And as for actually tasting and eating the pie, um, as for using our immense technological powers 
to produce for people lives in which they are healthy, safe, secure, and happy. You know, while I look out at the world right now and I see an awful lot of unhappy people in spite of many of them having technological powers that previous centuries would have said are vastly in excess of what anyone might actually need in a utopia. You mentioned Max Weber, the German pioneer <coughs> yeah. of sociology in your book. Um, you, you're touching, and, and we'll talk more about disenchantment. Weber invented the notion of disenchantment outside mm -hmm. of economists, leading economists, uh, the, the Keynes's and the Hayek's of the world that we're going to talk about. Do you think that Weber is the most important non-economic thinker? I mean, he wasn't principally an economist, although he, he was so smart, he seemed to cover every subject. But um, yeah. do you think Weber was the most important long 20th century thinker? I think he was more important for the study of the long 20th, of the long 19th century and earlier. Um, because Weber is primarily um, a sociologist of modes of cultural understanding and a sociology of, of mode and a sociologist of modes of political domination. Right? Um, and you know, cultural understanding and political domination are important um, for the 20th century. But back in the old days when technological progress was slower, you know, they were much more important in relative terms than in the age since 1870, when I think you want to look more to Schumpeter, von Hayek, Karl Polanyi, and Keynes. Yeah, but they're all economists, Brad. I mean, yes, they are economists. So um, are, are you suggesting that stuff. in a funny kind of way, the 20th century, your book is not an economic history of the 20th century. It's a history of the economic 20th century, that, that all history of the 20th century is economic. Yes. yes, and this is actually the first century for which this is true. Right? That previously, if you wanted to look at economic big changes, you had to kind of do the Fernand Braudel thing and look at the long run, the long durée. Um, but in the 20th century, the most important fact to know about 1900 was that the economy had been revolutionized relative to how it had been in 1870. And so as a result, an enormous amount of wealth had been created by what Schumpeter calls creative destruction, but also entire industries, businesses, occupations, and livelihoods you know, had been destroyed or were on the point of being pushed out. And that this was going to happen again and again and again and again every generation after 1900 as well. So rather than kind of simply being the backdrop in which kind of people go to their jobs and live their lives, and that doesn't change that much while politics and culture and you know, war do the main business of history, it's everyone trying to figure out how to react to the fact that the economy today is very different than it was 30 years ago and will be very different again in 30 more years. Um, that people trying to grapple and deal with that, that is at the heart of pretty much everything. Some people might say, well, you would think like that. You're an economist. Yes. You know, um, this is perhaps the only century in which economists with their biases and predispositions actually do have the key to the riddle of history, um, which is definitely in other hands when you try to analyze earlier centuries. Uh, Brad, many years ago, I was a grad student in political science at Berkeley. Berkeley uh, Barrows, so I'm not sure if it's still true, but the economists and the political scientists shared a building. What would your mm -hmm. political science colleagues say about this idea of economics being the queen of the sciences, the social sciences of the 20th century, defining the century? Well, I'm going over to the building formerly named Barrows in two What's it hours. now? What's it now called? I think now it's just called the Social Sciences Building. I think they're looking for a new name. Um, You're not going to rename you know, it Ka Ka the Keynes or the Hayek building? No, someone, you know, um, someone we actually like who gave lots of money to Berkeley is, I think, the hope. Um, 
At any event, I'm going over to political science land to talk about slouching towards utopia with, as my discussant, the amazing Robert Brenner from UCLA, who's coming up for the afternoon. And I'll tell you what they say. When are you doing that? Four o'clock this afternoon. Oh, oh, as a jump over. Well, let's let's get into the heart of the book, which is mm-hmm. about not just economics, but economists. I mean, we're not going to be able to get through everyone. I mean, Keynes, in my view, as a non-economist, was the most remarkable uh, economist of the 20th century because he did so many mm-hmm. other things. What is it about yeah. Keynes that makes him so important, Brett? Um... I don't know. There's a particular the that British public schools and then universities in the late 19th, early 20th century, you know, they were overwhelmingly, you know, landlords and merchants and industrialists kids. But there also were some people who academics and other people who weren't as rich kids who were admitted on their brains. Um, and so Keynes very early got used to being very smart among the people who were going to rule the British Empire. And somehow the reaction of his peers was that Maynard is someone we really ought to listen to when we have a sticky problem because he's quite good at solving them. Um, And so there's this arrogance of being both a meritocratic, of being a meritocratic superstar and also a Edwardian era upper class twit. Um, which he uses to say whatever he wants, whenever he wants, Um, and also to apply his brain to trying to understand the world. Then after the catastrophe of World War I, he has the arrogance of thinking that he himself can work to put it back on its proper track. Um, And it's that um, aggressive forward, I'm going to matter, and I will make people listen to me, plus being pretty smart and seeing a lot of things very clearly that I think made him so influential. And indeed, at one point, I was toying with writing at least the middle third of this book as, you know, kind of the history through the biography of John Maynard Keynes, you know, in the same way that Winston Churchill over and over again would write 20th century history as a, as a piece of the biography of Winston Churchill. You talk about the First World War, of course, Keynes is a, I wouldn't say a creature, but a, his, in, his, his career is a result of the, the First World right. War and the consequences, the crisis and collapse eventually of the British Empire. But mm-hmm. there's another world, the world of Middle Europe, of the crisis of the Habsburg Empire, which generates also in some ways um, a more substantial um, intellectual legacy, uh, the world of Hayek and of Pogliani. You, you seem to see this debate, this ongoing debate between Hayek and Pogliani and the students of Hayek and Pogliani is defining mm-hmm. the, the boundaries, yeah. the intellectual boundaries of the tw- 20th century. Mm-hmm. What is Shall it about say- Hayek and Pogliani that's so important? Besides that they grew up fairly close to each other in Vienna and right. were all kind of reacting to Austria that was both modern and antique at the same time. You know, well, von Hayek saw more clearly than everybody else that if you actually want to get something done, um, what you really want to do is crowdsource its solution, right? To throw the problem out to everybody and have everybody think about it and come up with the best ideas because, you know, two heads are better than one and, you know, eight billion heads today, there's bound to be a better idea in those eight billion than in any one person you choose to be your leader. So you really would like to crowdsource things. And if you can set things up properly, then, you know, a market economy is a wonderful way to crowdsource the solutions to problems. Um, simply get market prices right in the sense of being aligned with social values. And then people with the information to do good um, will be able to do good in a market economy because they will control resources. But that's what private property is good for. 
Um, and they also will be incentivized to do good because if prices are properly aligned with social values, there's a good deal of money to be made there. Um, so von Hayek was all about how, well, we have these wonderful technologies, let's just let the market rip. And that will make us all rich. Um, Polanyi, by contrast, said, wait a minute, that simply isn't going to work. You know, a market economy tends to corrode other forms of social power and influence and ultimately winds up in a world in which the only rights that people have are property rights. And, you know, people simply will not stand for that. People will not stand for a world in which the only way you have voice and influence is if you're rich. Instead, people will demand that they have a neighborhood that they recognize and which they feel comfortable will demand that there is a certain stability in their life, that their job stays, or if their job ends, they can find a new job, rather than have their entire occupation and livelihood, say, dry up and blow away because of the decisions of some rootless cosmopolite financier 5,000 miles away. And people will demand that their income and social standing be appropriate to what they deserve, and also that other people not um, have incomes and social standings that are much more than they deserve or much less. Um, so Polanyi said, you try to create von Hayek, a von Hayekian world, a world in which the market economy rules and use it to make ourselves massively more productive, you're going to have a social explosion because people will say, wait a minute, um, all these rights of mine, the market economy is dissing them, we need to change things. We need some kind of change of government, change of regime, some kind of revolution. Um, and it could be Benito Mussolini, it could be Vladimir Lenin, it could be Francisco Franco or Adolf Hitler, or you know, in a more positive direction, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Um, it could be Donald Trump, or it could be you know, Ronald Reagan or Margaret Thatcher. There will be a reaction as what people think social justice ought to be for their society, you know, takes the four um, and then reacts against the market economy. You know, a good example of this is, of course, the post-Civil War United States South, um, which lags behind the rest of the United States, you know, for badly, very badly for a hundred years, largely because people say, wait a minute, if we actually let the market economy grow and industrialize and educate our people and build roads and schools and so forth, well, these blacks are going to get above themselves. Um, so we got to star our schools and not build any roads because we don't want them getting more than they deserve. Um, and that kind of dynamic between a technology that's improving at an enormous rate a market economy that's making us rich, but at the price of the destructive part of Schumpeterian creative destruction, and a Polanyian backlash in which people insist that we not say, blessed be the name of the market, but instead that the market was made for man and try to rejigger it so that it actually serves what the, what the people at the time regard as social justice. Um, that those are the things that kind of block the 20th century from being a much happier set of stories. You mentioned, of course, well, you just talked about Hayek, you mentioned Thatcher and Reagan and the revolution, the Thatcher-Reagan revolution yeah. that seems to define the last third, at least, of the 20th century. We did a show earlier this year with the Cambridge University economic historian Gary Gerstel on neoliberalism. Oh, he has yes, yes, a, uh, great a book out You're not the rise and fall book of the is. yes, yeah, it's yes, a really good book, the rise and fall of the neoliberal book. order. Yeah. Do you agree with um, Gary Gerstel that that the last third, really, or perhaps the last forty years of the formal twentieth century, say between the nineteen sixties and the end of the century, can be defined by Hayekian neoliberalism? Well, there certainly is a von Hayekian kind of counteroffensive against what Gary in an earlier book, kind of the first two chapters of this book, calls the New Deal Order. Right. right? The New Deal Order, if I can, you know, the, 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 the thumbnail way of putting it 
is that in the New Deal order, you have a shotgun marriage between von Hayek and Polanyi, blessed by John Maynard Keynes, in which it's agreed we're going to let the market economy rip, but we're also going to have all of these social programs around it to vindicate people's Polanyian rights, um, one way or another. And behind it all, there's going to be a Keynesian commitment to a full employment policy so that if people lose their jobs, they're confident they'll be able to find other ones easily so that it's not that great an idea. And full employment policies will keep interest rates and profit rates relatively low because of easy monetary policy. And that'll keep the super rich from exercising too much influence over society because if they really want to use their plutocratic wealth for so as social power, they'll have to spend down their capital and then they'll no longer be plutocrats. And you know that produced um, a wonderful post-World War II generation. But in the 1970s, it all falls apart. It fails its sustainability test. And you get the election of you know, Thatcher and Reagan and things move in such a direction, right? It was not, um, it was not Ronald Reagan or Margaret Thatcher, it was Bill Clinton who said in his State of the Union address that the era of big social democratic government is over. You know, why even Eric Hobsbawm, um, if you read his Forward March of Labor Halted, if you read um, The Age of Extremes, you find himself talking about labor unions whose social power is based on how much extraordinary inconvenience they can cause the public, um, kind of through, through sudden strikes. And Hobsbawm writes that the good ship social democracy needed a thorough Thatcherite neoliberal cleansing, as even the British left um, grew eventually to admit. Um, and, you know, even you know, Eric Hobsbawm um, turns out to be a Thatcherite to, to a substantial degree. That's a sign of how much I think Gary has his finger on something, you know, that the New Deal order that he had chronicled in earlier books does fail its sustainability test in the 1970s and is replaced by this alternative way of doing government and thinking about society that we call neoliberalism. You, um, you wrote a, a nice piece on, in January 6th um, from this year, Pessimism Amid Progress. You write, within the space of just a few generations, humanity has created the material conditions for establishing the kind of society that our ancestors could hardly imagine. But everything now depends on whether we can figure out the politics of wealth distribution. A couple of years ago, I did an interview with one of your colleagues at Berkeley, Gabriel Zuckman, one of, yeah. I guess, one of the mini Pickettys. He has a new book out, or it had been new with Emmanuel Sayers, mm -hmm. The Triumph of Injustice. Is that how the 20th century ends in 2010, Brad, with this contradiction between the age of wealth and prosperity and the increasing inequality that you describe? I would say that inequality is a big piece of it, you know. Um, but I would say that the, the slowdown in the rate of technological progress, um, as it turns out that the information technology revolution is not as big a deal as previous technological revolutions. Um, the end of America being being viewed by most other countries as the, the furnace where the future is being forged, as Leon Trotsky called it, um, that that happens in the first decade of the, the 21st calendrical century. The end of the United States' role as kind of a you know, good guy assembler of alliances um, and the substitution of the go-it-alone cowboy United States of you know, George W. Bush's attack on Iraq and of Donald Trump, in which we're going to throw our weight around rather than consult with allies. Um, the rise of what our president is now calling semi-fascism, not just in the United States, but in Brazil, in Hungary, in Turkey, in India. Um, the coming of China, it is who's political economic system is um, not von Hayek married to Polanyi, blessed by Keynes, 
but as in rather von Hayek married the Lenin, blessed by Master Kung, as something that's making a serious play for we actually have a better system. You know, um, Xi Jinping may not be the best of all possible leaders, but he certainly looks competent and he reads his briefing materials and doesn't take boxes home, doesn't take boxes of ma secret materials home and leave them in basement storerooms um, unguarded, you know, that all of those things change the tenor of what's happening, plus global warming rises to the fore as a major problem that the world is not good at grappling with, um, that all of these things make the thrust of history no longer, we're becoming richer at a fabulous rate now the problem is to figure out how to equitably distribute it and then utilize our wealth to create a good world um, instead. And we know the United States is kind of leading the way at this. Um, instead, we have a different story that we do not yet know what it is. Yeah, perhaps, um, and I want to talk about this in a second, uh, perhaps the 21st century would be a post-economics century yeah. uh, I, i'm curious brad uh, as to the title of your book um yeah. slouching towards utopia of course it reminds yeah. one of slouching towards bethlehem joan didion's great collection which she wrote mostly yeah. in over the bay in san francisco where yeah. i am did you mm -hmm. borrow from that or did you come up with the title independently of didion no of course I borrowed from it just as she did right um that it comes from the most <laughs> plundered poem in the english language you know William Butler Yeats's The Second Coming, um, about how you expect something marvelous and utopia and transformative and transfigurational um, to come in both Yeats and Didion out of Bethlehem. And instead of, you know, a human or a positive progress, we have a slouch. And in Yeats's poem, what is slouching, what is going to be our future is it's not just something that doesn't stand tall, but slouches, you know, it's a very rough beast. That we think, what we think is utopia or paradise is instead going to be something very unexpected and not really what we ordered at all. Um, that that's the gravamen of Yeats's um, poem, um, which starts with the falcon not hearing the falconer and the center cannot hold, um, the center not holding. So yes, I mean, you steal from the best. Um, and I think Yeats was definitely the best of poets in the 20th century. Let's Didion talk about, uh, let's end, uh, Brad. The book is wonderful and all these issues are Thank so you. important in this Thank long 20th century, but it, it gives one an appetite for the 21st century. Yeah. Um, you know, my conversation with Gary Gerstle, what's particularly intriguing is what comes next. Yes. It's not clear. You mentioned um, the climate. We've done a number of shows about life supposedly after capitalism with uh, perhaps we might call them eco-socialists like Tim right. Jackson. Um, yes. What do you make of this idea or ideal of there being life after capitalism in this post 2010 world. Is there anything to it or is it just a uh, liberal idealism? Well, you know, I mean, it was more than 90 years ago that John Maynard Keynes wrote that he expected us to have life after capitalism today. You right. know, that we would no longer have to worry about avarice and usury and precaution and make them our gods and pretend that they were good things. Um, but instead, we would have relatively ample wealth. And the question was, how to use it to live wisely and well? Part of using it to live wisely and well would mean not pouring more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So that at the moment, the monsoon has been shifted south. And so the rivers of Pakistan have put a third of the country underwater, while the Yangtze River is five meters below what it's supposed to be. And that's because a small shift in the monsoon changes how much precipitation lands on the northern as opposed to the southern slope of the Himalayas. Um, certainly, yes, there is a... That back in 1870, when your average, child, average male child grew up to be five foot three rather than five foot nine, 
which is our mode, right? Um, you know, if you were to make your, you were to feed your son the diet that made them five foot three at adulthood, San Francisco Child and Protective Services would have long since taken your child away. In the world of 1870, focusing on maximizing production and pushing productive technologies forward you know, is very close to an imperative because of how poor humanity was then was. Now, yes, we should be shifting more resources to figuring out how to live wisely and well with the wealth we have, rather than figuring out how to create social systems that invest and invest more and pile up more and more of it. Is there a school for this, though? We did a show recently with the English journalist George Monbiot on regenesis. Oh. There's lots of ideas yeah. of regenerative economics. There's mm -hmm. the notion of the donut economics. Do you see the beginnings of a, 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 a structural shift, Brad, where we're seeing the next world after Hayek and Keynes and Pagliani? Not yet, right? I mean, it seems to be much easier to mobilize people against enemies foreign and domestic you know, than to mobilize people for utopia and for building it. Um, although I am encouraged by, you know, have you had Will McCaskill on yet? No, I need to get him. You, know, you should try because you know effective altruism on the one hand and long termism on the other. You know, acting as though we are truly stewards of the world and the universe are, I think, very hopeful signs um, in terms of getting people to think about the right things. What about finally, Brad? Uh, you're talking to me from Berkeley, just over the bay. Uh, mm -hmm. The third piece of our triangle, San Francisco, Berkeley, is, of course, Silicon Valley. Uh, yes. You mentioned Keynes imagining a world after capitalism. Keynes imagined smart machines that replaced us. Um, mm -hmm. Is that the core of the 21st century economy, smart machines, robots, the replacement of human labor, mostly by machines that will do our dirty work? Or is that another delusion well, of Silicon Valley. We have, right? Um, to some extent, we largely have, right? If you look back at us in the real old days, you know, um, we added value because we had strong backs and strong thighs to move things. We added value because we had nimble fingers in order to finally manipulate things. We added values because we had the kind of eye brain hand loops to kind of control things. Um, and yet the strong, the thighs and backs were replaced first by the horse, then by the steam engine, now by other things. The nimble fingers, well, we replaced them starting with automatic textile machinery, and now we're quite far along um, with that. The eye brain hand process control loops, um, we have those. Um, what was left, what's left beyond that is our mouths to communicate with each other to convey information from one human brain to another, um, human brains to think up genuinely new ideas, and also um, you know, every single machine, every single animal, um, up until very recently, every single thing with which we replace a human back or a human hand um, has needed a microcontroller, and the only microcontroller available has been the one that fits in a bread box and draws 50 watts of power called the human brain. And now we're getting to the point of being actually able to replace, we have replaced most of the human brains that we needed on our goods production assembly lines. And increasingly we're replacing them in terms of communications you know, um, that, do you know, I guess saw a software program last week that writes B-level answers to the short answer questions I was asking at Berkeley last year, if you prompt it with the seven correct keywords. Um, the question then is, what else are we going to do um, when we no longer have to spend so much time producing just what we need to keep ourselves alive? And you know, what particular niches will humans find to do? when a whole bunch of the business of production has been moved off of our backs 
in our hands and our fingers and even off to death off of the necessity that our brains keep watch um, in order to keep control of systems. You know, but it will be quite a while, right? I mean, they keep on trying to build self-driving cars and they keep on managing to build a system that will successfully drive over one particular course but then it keeps on getting lost and flaming out whenever you try to have it deal with any other situation that's even slightly different. It will be quite a while before we're actually going to have to face yeah, the fact that our machines are intelligent enough to do an awful lot of work that is properly ours. Well, Brad, I hope you're busy now working on an economic history of the 21st century, maybe featuring Alan Turing or... Hayek's oh. Oh. Uh, equivalent, uh, von Neumann, be very interesting, mm -hmm. but certainly mm -hmm. uh, Slouching Towards Utopia is a wonderful book. Congratulations. Thank you very um, much. It's going to be one of the bestsellers. I don't know if you really want a bestseller, but it is going to be one. Uh, so congratulations on that, Brad. What else are you reading? Mm -hmm. I'm sure you are very um, busy I reading. Said, I, very, I highly recommend Gary on the rise and fall of the neoliberal order. And, yeah. you know, Will McCaskill, Mr. Effective Altruism, and now Mr. Long-Termism. You know, act today as if your actions will shape the future of the trillion human beings that will live in the future. Um, his book, What We Owe the Future, is also, I think, very good. Although it reads to me as if he's taken six 50-page book proposals and stapled them together. Um, because I really wish he had written six 300-page books rather than the one 300 page book he has. I keep on wanting more from each piece of that. So McCaskill 